As a dad, uh, you're pretty protective of your kids. You know, you think you can do anything you want to me, but don't mess with my kids. This was tough for Carmen and I when our oldest was uh, in the middle of grade school and he ended up uh, in a bullying situation. And this was going on and on and we were doing the things that we could to talk to the people that we needed to talk to and it just didn't seem like we were getting the answers and the help that we needed. And as this began to escalate, we got to the place uh, where this young kid threatened my son with a knife. And we're just like, okay, that's enough. I was on the phone and I was talking to people and I was probably talking in ways that I shouldn't have been talking as a pastor of a church. But I was just said, if you don't do something, I'm going to take care of it myself. I'm going to teach my son how to take care of this himself. And you're not going to do anything to him. I'm not saying this is how you should handle things. I'm just telling you what I did. I was going to stick up for my son. And then one day, ding dong, I go to the door. And there standing on my porch was this young man that had been bullying my son. And he said, can Jaden come out and play? This has been years that this happened and I can still remember what it felt like having him standing there on my porch, someone that had been abusive to my son, the anger that was in my heart, the bitterness that was in my heart. You want my son to come out and play with you. How do you respond in a moment like that? As a follower of Jesus, Jesus that teaches us about forgiveness, how do you respond to a moment like that? The reason I ask, and we'll call this little boy Timmy, uh, the reason that I ask is because you're gonna have Timmies that show up on your porch too. People that have done things to hurt you, people that have caused pain in your life, people that have wronged you, big things and small things. You're gonna be snubbed. You're gonna be overlooked. You're gonna be criticized, slandered maybe, different forms of injustice. But some of you are gonna experience and have experienced big things. Abuse, emotional and physical abuse. The betrayal of a spouse sexual assault, it runs the gamut, a huge spectrum. All these things can be in our heart. How do we respond to people in our life that have hurt us? How do we engage around this topic of forgiveness? How do we not become a person that is just full of offense and bitterness and unforgiveness? And you might be saying, you know, I, 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 I'm fine. I don't have anything going on. I don't have anybody to forgive. Let me, let me ask you this. This is how I know when there's people in my life that I need to forgive. And I've said this before, but it's so true of me. It's the imaginary conversations that I have. You have them too. I'm not the only one. You know those conversations that you have with that person that wronged you? And in those imaginary conversations, you're always so right. And you always say just the right thing. And they don't know what to say. And then a crowd starts to form around you and they all start cheering you on. You know those imaginary conversations that lets us know that there's something in our heart that we need to deal with. And maybe for you, it's that walking around a grocery store aisle and you see this person that you haven't seen and then all of a sudden there's this like, and you know there's something between me and that person. There's something in my heart. And maybe some of you, you've got this story from your past that you just keep telling over and over and over again till people around you are sick of it. And maybe you're not actually saying it to people, you're just saying it to yourself in your mind over and over again because you're in bondage to your past. How do we keep from turning into people that are bitter, angry, and offended? How do we release ourselves from being controlled by the bondage of our past? It was interesting just thinking about this topic of bitterness and unforgiveness, and I was just doing some research out there like, what are the effects of bitterness and unforgiveness on us? And this isn't from a Christian perspective. This is just from a medical perspective. The Mayo Clinic did this study on what are the costs that they observe in the life of a person 
that deals with unforgiveness and bitterness. This is what they found, is that those people tend to bring anger and bitterness into every relationship, not just the broken relationship, to every relationship and new experience that they have. They get so wrapped up in the past, they said, that it makes it almost impossible to be able to enjoy the present. And this really grabbed my attention just because, as Brian even just shared, there's, just, there's so much uh, depression and anxiety out there and people trying to seek help for that. They said people that hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness have higher and increased levels of depression and anxiety. They find it difficult to find meaning and purpose in life. And it's difficult for them to create connectedness, deep connectedness with other people when they're dealing with bitterness and unforgiveness. Johns Hopkins did another study where they talked about the huge health benefits of forgiveness, lowering the risk of heart attack, improving cholesterol and levels of sleep, reducing pain, blood pressure, anxiety, depression, and stress. Here's one of the things that I thought was fascinating. They said that this forgiveness, health, connection actually increases as we get older. What they're saying is this, if we don't deal with bitterness and unforgiveness, it has a compounding effect in our life. This is just from a world's perspective. Bitterness and unforgiveness has an incredible physical toll, emotional toll, relational toll that it plays in our life. But you aren't here just to talk about that. You're here to talk about your spiritual life. What is the spiritual toll that bitterness and unforgiveness has in our life? Here's what we're gonna study as we look at this is that forgiveness matters to Jesus. And this is just simple for us to think about. Jesus knew the kind of world that all of us were gonna live in, no matter what time period you lived in. You are gonna live in a broken world where people are going to offend you. You are gonna get angry. You are going to be wronged. But Jesus wanted it to be really, really clear for us. How is it that we're to respond to those opportunities in life, those things that happen to us? How is it that we are to respond. We're going to look at a text of scripture today that's a, a story that Jesus told, but there's a way that this story was brought up because Jesus throughout his life and ministry, he is talking over and over again about this topic of forgiveness. So the disciples, uh, they're figuring it out. They're just thinking, Jesus, this is very important. How important is it? And this raises a question for Peter. Peter has a question, what extent do we need to buy into this whole forgiveness thing? Matthew chapter 18, starting in verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now you need to understand that Peter, as he's saying that, he's thinking that that's a lot. Seven times is a lot. The, the Jewish writings at that time, the Talmud, which is just the Jewish commentary on the law of Moses, their rule was three times. Three strikes and you're out. After you've forgiven someone three times, there's no forgiveness needed beyond that. So Peter's thinking seven. If Jesus is really into that, it's probably something like seven times. But Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven times, or 70 times seven. What's Jesus trying to say? It's like, Peter, don't, don't, don't try to count. Don't try to use your fingers and toes. There's, there's no number. There is no end to the forgiveness that you are to extend to people in your life and in your world. And then he tells this story to help the disciples understand how important this is. He said, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. The number is just huge, 10,000 bags of gold, like billions. Since he was not able to pay, the master had ordered that his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back 
everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. And that silver coin, the idea is that's about the equivalent of a day's wage. So not insignificant, a hundred days wages, that's significant. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged. And when he told their master everything and went and told their man that it happened, then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This, Jesus said, this is how your, my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Forgiveness matters to Jesus. What we're gonna look at today as we kind of look at this story and other key scriptures is there is a clear command to forgive in scripture. We're gonna look at what is the cost of unforgiveness in our life. We're gonna look at what is our capacity, what gives us the power to forgive. How do we do it is how we're gonna close. The first is the command to forgive. You, just reading the story, you understand how important this is to Jesus. But he made many clear commands around forgiveness when he taught throughout his life in ministry. Mark eleven twenty five 25 says this, when you and when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them so that your father in heaven may forgive you your sins. A couple of key words there. Anything. Anyone. You know, you know so many times we try to look for a loophole Loophole in the teachings of Jesus. It is so clear. He is not giving us a loophole around forgiveness. He says, if you have anything against anyone, it's really, really clear what Jesus is asking. But we've got to understand that it is really, really difficult to follow through on what Jesus is asking us to do. Because here's what's happening. I believe this is happening in the back of people's minds right now. Some of you are saying, yeah, I get that. That makes sense but you don't know my story. You don't know what happened to me. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know what they stole from me. You don't know what they took from me. You don't know how they treated me. And honestly, I have to say that is absolutely true. I don't know. And if I could, if I got to sit down with you and you were to share your story with me, there would probably be compassion in my heart that I would be like, oh my gosh, that is so difficult. I understand why it's so difficult for you to forgive. I know some of you have gone through terrible, traumatic things, but at the end of the day, I would need to grab your hands and we would go together and walk back to the command of Jesus. Anyone against anything, forgive them. I had the opportunity to actually hear a story from a young woman that's a part of our congregation. Five years ago when she was 15, at her small high school. She was there just before classes were getting started and there was commotion out in the hallway. And some girls came running in and they said, it seems like there's someone out in the hallway that has a gun. And so she ran to the hallway instinctively. As she got to the door, she opened the door and she started to hear gunshots. And she watched right in front of her, her best friend shot and killed. And three other of her teammates in her high school were wounded 
in that incident and had the opportunity to sit and talk with her and listen to her story. Listen to what God did in and through her life as she worked to bring forgiveness in her heart towards someone that had done the unthinkable in her life. It was so powerful. Anyone who does anything against you, forgive them. It's hard work. It's hard work to do it because it is hard work and it's gonna cost you something. It's gonna cost you something to do the hard work that Jesus is asking us to do to forgive people. But we need to understand the cost of not forgiving people is even greater in our life. There is a cost that is so great you don't wanna pay it. What is the cost of unforgiveness? Hebrews chapter 12 says this, make every effort effort to live in peace with everyone and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. See to it that no one falls short of the grace of God and that no bitter root grows up to cause trouble and to defile many. Some key terms in there, see to it. That word that's translated there is saying, pay attention, look closely. You've gotta pay attention because those little seeds of bitterness can be planted in our heart. And if we don't deal with them in a timely fashion, if we don't pull up that root, they can tend to grow in our life. They begin to sprout fruit in our life. Even if we keep trying to cut the tree off at the top, when those roots go down, the tree continues to sprout up in our life. We've got to watch out because those hidden roots work in hidden ways and they will sprout. They will sprout. It's guaranteed. And what the writer of Hebrews says, this is what's going to happen. It's going to cause trouble and it's going to defile many. Not only is it gonna cause trouble for you personally in your own heart, in your own life, it's gonna be poison into the life of people around you and defile many. It's gonna have an effect in all of your relationships if you don't deal with the things that you're bitter and angry about toward other people. When people are hurt, they tend to hurt others. Hurt people. Wounded people, bitter, angry people tend to hurt others. You've probably seen this in your life. You might even be thinking about people right now. People that you know have never gotten over bitterness and anger and unforgiveness towards something that's happened to them. It only takes one bitter person to ruin a relationship. It only takes one bitter person to destroy a whole family. It only takes one bitter person to ruin a church, to cause trouble and defile many. We've got to deal with unforgiveness, no matter how difficult it is. This is what was grabbing my attention. I was thinking about the very end of that parable when it talks about the king, the master, what he does to those that are unwilling to forgive, throws them in prison and tortures them. I think for the longest time, I, I've kind of imagined that that was the picture of God doing some kind of active torture of us, some kind of active discipline of us for unforgiveness. But as I've reflected on this, I believe that this is true. All God does is just let us experience the consequences of our own unwillingness to forgive, that pain and anger that affects our physical life, our emotional life, our spiritual life. He just lets us experience the consequences of those things. We create the prison. God doesn't create a jail to throw us into. We create it of our own doing because we're unwilling to forgive other people. See to it. Pay attention. Don't let even the littlest seed of bitterness and anger and unforgiveness start to take root in your life. But what's gonna need to happen is that we learn the practice of forgiveness. We've gotta learn that this is something that we do, not just one and done, 
here and there. This is something that we learn to do over and over in our life. But here's what I believe. Before we're ever able to do that, we've got to understand what Jesus would want us to understand in terms of what is our capacity to forgive. Where does the power to forgive come from? Now that parable that Jesus told, and what a parable is, it's just a, it's just a story with a punchline. There's just a point to the story. And here's the punchline of the parable that Jesus told. You can't give to others what you have never received. You can't give to others what you yourself have never received. And that's why this story makes so much sense to us. We've got this one servant that was forgiven billions of dollars, an insurmountable debt, forgiven billions. But when he walks away from having been forgiven so much, he sees someone that owes him not tiny thing, a significant thing, but in comparison, way smaller. And he grabs them by the throat and demands that they pay him back. Now, when you're listening to that story, it's, it's just really intuitive. Just when you hear it, you just think, man, that dude's a jerk. I mean, where did, where did, what is he even thinking? Like, look what was done for you. That's what every one of those hearers of that story thought in their own heart and mind is what every one of us thought. That's what makes this story so powerful. But as soon as we, friends, say that, Jesus can grab us by the throat and hold up the mirror and say, friends, that is you. That is you when you are unwilling to forgive the smaller things in your own life when I have forgiven you so much. And so what Jesus wants us to understand, when we're unwilling to forgive, it's letting him know one of two things. Either we have never received his gift of forgiveness, or we don't understand what that even means, or maybe we did at one time, but we've completely lost sight of what it is that God has done for us. Friends, the only way that we're gonna be able to take a step toward forgiveness in the lives of people is if we keep our eyes fixed on the cross, constantly being reminded of what it is that Jesus did for us. And that's why the Apostle Paul, and I'm gonna go back to a scripture that we started this series with because the Apostle Paul believed that forgiving and living a life unoffended with people around us was actually possible. That's how crazy he was. Paul thinks that this forgiving life can be done. But here's what he says. We have to focus on God's grace. Ephesians chapter four, starting in verse 31. Paul says, get rid, just get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. And on the contrary, be kind and compassionate to one another. And then here's Paul's punchline forgiving each other just as in Christ, God forgave you. How do we forgive other people? Just as in Christ, God forgave us. Just as. Paul's saying just as to the same extent, in the same way, to the same degree. That's how we forgive people, just as God did. How did God forgive us? How did he forgive us our sin and our wrong? He forgave us our sin fully. All of our sin, past, present, and future. When we bowed our need and made Jesus our king and put our faith and trust in him for the forgiveness of sin, all of our sin was taken care of past, present, and future. Secondly, our sin was paid for freely. Freely. When I say freely, what I'm saying is that we didn't have to earn it. There was nothing that we had to do to earn it. But does that mean that it was not costly? Oh, it was costly. It was infinitely costly. But Jesus was the one that stepped in and said, I'm willing to pay the cost for you. You don't owe me anymore. 
He forgave us fully. He forgave us freely. And he forgave us finally. When Jesus was on the cross, stretched out, he said, it is finished. Meaning it is done, debt paid in full. The only way, friends, that we're gonna be able to forgive others in our lives is when we realize the magnitude of what Jesus did for us, the spiritual wealth that we have in receiving forgiveness from God. People that are incredibly wealthy, it's much easier for them to be generous because they can be super generous, but it doesn't affect their bottom line the way it does other people. That's why we need to realize our incredible spiritual wealth, what God has poured out in our life. Because when we understand the magnitude of what we've been given, it makes it intuitive. It makes, it makes sense that we would extend that to others. We get to be a conduit of what it is that God has done in our life to others. And in fact, I'm gonna just say it as strongly as I think I should. When you bowed your knee to Jesus, if you have and made him your king and received the forgiveness that was given to you, you lost your right to be able to be unforgiving toward other people. That's what Jesus wants us to understand. When we said yes to him, we lost our right to hold bitterness or unforgiveness toward anyone. Okay, so how do we do this? I wanna be really, really practical with you. I wanna give you something that I hope will be something that will stick in your mind and you can do it when you go home. This is what we're gonna do. Because forgiveness is talking about a debt and debtor relationship, that's how we're gonna think about it. We need to think about what does it mean for us to cancel the debt? There's four things that I believe that we need to do. The first one is identify who owes you a debt. This is what I want you to do a three by five card or a piece of paper or anything, parchment, whatever you have at home, whatever you can write on, write on there, who owes you a debt? And this is probably the easiest because there's some of you that right now your pictures of people have been going through your head even as I've been talking. You know that there's forgiveness work that you need to do. Maybe it's imaginary conversations. Maybe it's that painful story that you keep telling over and over. You just gotta think about who is it that owes you a debt Write that name down on a three by five card. Who owes you a debt? But I'm also gonna ask you to do this. Maybe nobody's picture or face is coming to your mind. Take some time to ask God, would you reveal to me? Is there, is there something, is there a root of bitterness in me that because it's been a part of my life so long, I've just made peace with it. It's so a part of me that I don't even see it as anything that's wrong. Would you let God? His Holy Spirit surfaced that in your life. Who is it that owes me a debt? And now this next thing that I'm gonna ask you to do, you're gonna be tempted to skip this. But I think this is really important. You need to identify the debt. What is it that they took from you? What is it that they owe you? And here's why this is important. You can't forgive a debt that you are unable or unwilling to define. What is it that they took from you? Maybe it's something tangible. Maybe it's money or a possession. But oftentimes what's taken from us is something that's not as concrete as that. Maybe it was your reputation, a relationship. Maybe it was your childhood that you thought you deserved, that your parents didn't give to you. Maybe it was your innocence that was stolen from you, your emotional health, sleepless nights, because of the hurt and pain. Maybe you feel like a job was taken from you, future opportunities. It can be anything, but define the debt because you can't forgive a debt that you're unwilling or unable to define. Write a name, write what it is that they owe you. And then the third thing that we do is that we decide. We decide to cancel the debt. And when I say decide, I'm talking about it is a decision. It is an act of the will. It is an act of the will that says, you don't owe me anymore. You don't 
owe me anymore. And I know what happens. I know in our flesh, you can look at that torn up piece of paper, but something in you says, but they do owe me. It's not fair. They took something from me. They do owe me. And that's true. But that's the essence of forgiveness, is that we look at even in the reality that they owe us, we say, you don't owe me anymore, fully, freely, finally. And here's the reality. Most things that people have taken from us, they couldn't pay us back if they wanted to. They can't give you back your reputation. They can't give you back your innocence. They can't give you back your childhood. Why would we hold something over someone that they don't even have the ability to give back to us if they wanted to? Forgiveness costs to tear that up and to say, I'm going to bear the debt of what you did. It is costly. But friends, here's what we have to understand. If we're going to take seriously the things that we talk about around here, that Jesus is calling us to be an all in follower of him. It means that we need to live the kind of life that Jesus lived. And he lived a life of forgiveness. He was willing to take upon himself the cost of other people's sin. We are never Friends, we are never more like Jesus than we are bearing the sin of other people in our life. And now I know that there might be some people that are just saying, what about? There's some things that I just want to say that forgiveness is not. Forgiveness is not letting people continually sin against you. It is not a loving thing to let someone continue in their sin. Sometimes there needs to be justice done. People need to pay the consequences of their sin, but not from us in our heart toward them. Sometimes we need to create boundaries around our life so that people don't continually abuse us or do the things that are wrong against us. We can create boundaries. Forgiveness isn't being a doormat. And I hope you hear this. Forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is a decision. It is not a feeling. If you wait, I, I, I just, I hear so many people like, I, I just don't feel it in my heart. I don't feel it in my heart toward people. If you wait to feel it, you will never extend forgiveness. Forgiveness is extended oftentimes long before we ever feel it. But it gives us at least the opportunity to break free from the prison of bitterness and unforgiveness. It's not a feeling, it's a decision. But ultimately, we wanna to work toward our hearts actually aligning with the forgiveness that we've offered people. How do we do that? The last thing I think is a challenging thing to do, but is the thing that will get us there, is to pray a blessing over our debtor. Pray a blessing over the person that wronged us. Here's what Jesus said, Luke chapter six. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Forgiveness is costly, it's hard to tear up and bear in yourself and your own life, the cost of somebody else's sin. But it could even be more challenging to put your hand over that and begin to pray a blessing over them, that God would do something in and through their life, that maybe in some way in our heart and mind, we can separate the evil that they did from who they are as a child of God, someone that God created, made in the image of God. We begin to pray a blessing over them. When I talked to that young gal that was involved in that school shooting, the thing that just gave me goosebumps was when she talked about how prayer for him, prayer for the one who shot and killed her best friend was the thing that God used to move her toward forgiveness of him. And that she even has these pictures and dreams that one day 
maybe that she would be able to invite him into her home to sit at her table and to give him a hug. Her heart has been moved toward forgiveness by praying consistently a blessing over this man who did incredible evil. But here's what really captured my attention. Her biggest concern now is she's still praying. She's praying for the people in her community. She said, there are so many people in my community that have not experienced the freedom from the bondage of bitterness and unforgiveness that I experienced. She said, I pray for them because oftentimes I talk to them. I listen to the things that come out of their mouths, even followers of Jesus. And they were so bitter and angry saying things like, I hope he rots in hell. She said, I pray for those people because the evil that's in their heart toward him is similar to the evil that caused him to do what he did. We need to be free from that. We need to pray for people that we would be free from that. I hope that there's something in your mind also that is saying, man, none of this makes sense. None of this is how life really works. This isn't what I experience in this world. This isn't fair. This is not natural. And I would say, amen. It is so true. Everything that I'm talking about will not come naturally to us. But friends, Jesus didn't call us to live a natural life. He called us to live a supernatural life. And the only way we're gonna be able to do the things that Jesus is asking us to do is if we allow him to live his life through us in the power of the Holy Spirit to be able to forgive others the way that Christ forgave us. As I close, I'm just thinking about what Jesus said, that the prerequisite for being able to forgive others is being able to experience his forgiveness. I'm imagining that there's some people in this room that you've, you've never experienced what I'm talking about as it relates to that forgiveness from God, that freedom from our sin. Or maybe you have, but you've completely lost sight of it and it's caused you to have a stranglehold and a grip on bitterness and unforgiveness in your life. I just wanna pray, wherever you are at today, that you would grab a hold of what God is offering to us, his forgiveness. And if that's where you are, don't wait another day. I'm gonna pray. And if that's your heart's desire, I want you to just, in your own heart, pray along with me. Grab a hold of what Jesus has done for us. Let's pray. Jesus, we need you. Jesus, fix our eyes on the cross. Fix our eyes on the reality that when we put our faith and our trust in you for the forgiveness of our sin, we are forgiven fully. Past, present, and future, we're forgiven freely. Not at cost to us, not that we have to earn, but that you earned it for us. You paid the debt. You look at us and say, you don't owe me anymore. And Jesus, you said that you paid it finally. It is finished. Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters that are in this room that have never grabbed a hold of that or have lost sight of that, that they would grab a hold of it today. God, move in our hearts so that we would respond to you and receive the magnitude of your forgiveness. Thank you that you look at us, Jesus, and say, you don't owe me anymore. And Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thanks for engaging with this content. If it was encouraging to you, we'd love for you to leave a review. Hit that subscribe button and share this content with others. We'd also love to connect with you. The best place to do that is journeyweb.net. Don't forget to follow us on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. Just search Journey Church Bozeman and you'll find us there. If you'd like to give to our ministry, you can do that now at journeyweb.net slash give. Once again, thanks for engaging with Journey Church.